If you write multi-threaded high-performance code, do yourself a favor and spend the 17 minutes it takes to watch this video. TLB shutdown is virtually unknown, myself included until very recently, and depending on the workload can have dramatic effect on your program's performance. So let's talk about it. Except before we do, I'm going to give some background material. In fact, quite a bit of it. Since there's a good chance that many of you already know this background, the chapter markers on the video can allow you to skip ahead to where the high noon, uh, I mean, shutdown stuff begins. Modern CPUs, so not those I typically talk about on this channel, have a hardware component that allows separating the addresses that the software thinks it accesses from the memory addresses it actually accesses. The addresses the code execution part of the CPUs use are called virtual addresses. The addresses actually mapped to memory are called physical addresses. Mapping from one to the other is a memory management unit, or MMU. As I said, the MMU translates virtual addresses to physical ones, but it also does access control. If, for example, we want a certain region to be accessible, but only for reading, not for writing, we can mark the region as read-only in the MMU. Any attempt by the CPU to write to the memory will cause the CPU to raise an exception. For this particular case, the exception is called a page fault. In order to perform this mapping, the MMU needs to know which virtual address maps to which physical one. To do so, the operating system uses a table where the index into the table is the virtual address and the content is the physical one. Let's take a moment to analyze that. For simplicity's sake, let's assume this is a 32-bit CPU. The CPU is 32 bits to address memory, so it can address at most 4 GB. What we need is a table saying where each of those 4 GB are actually stored in memory. So we need 4 billion entries, each 32-bit in size, mapping virtual to physical addresses. To store that table, we need carry the one, 16 GB. So we need 16 GB in order to create a mapping for 4 GB of memory. Needless to say, that's not how it's done. There are two techniques for reducing the amount of memory needed for the translation table. The first is reducing the granularity. We do not need to allow each and every byte to be individually remapped. We can map a bulk of contiguous virtual bytes to a bunch of contiguous physical bytes. Each such bunch is called a memory page. A very typical page size is 4 kilobyte or 12 bits. At this point, it should come as no surprise that this mapping is called the page table. So already, we don't need to map 4 billion addresses to 4 billion potential locations. We need only map 20 bits, or around 1 million addresses, to a similar amount of potential locations. This already reduces our memory requirements from 16 gigabyte to around 2.5 megabyte. A huge improvement. For 32-bit, this technique may actually work. For 64-bit, however, things are a little more tricky. It is highly likely that the amount of physical memory we have is not nearly enough to cover 64 bits of virtual memory. As such, most of the virtual memory is not going to be mapped to anything at all. There's just too much of it. Keeping the whole table is a huge waste of memory. To give us more control, the lookup from the page table is hierarchic. So for 32-bit, we might take the top 10 bits of the virtual address and use that to look up an entry in the first phase of the table. That will give us the address of the second table, where we'll use the next 10 bits to look up a value. That value is the physical address of the page, where the actual memory resides. This way, each entry in the first phase table is responsible for 4 megabytes of memory. If the entire 4 megabytes are unmapped, we don't need to perform the second lookup at all. We can save the memory we'd otherwise need for it. So the table is actually a tree, though, for some reason, page tree did not catch on. Here's the thing, though. The page table resides in memory. Of course it does. Where else would it reside? But now we have a problem. If your program wants to access the memory, the CPU first needs to read the page table entry relevant for the virtual address you asked for and translate that to the physical address where the data actually resides. In other words, each memory access you perform turns into three memory accesses that the CPU needs to perform. Of course, this is a simplified view. Actual number of accesses can be much, much 
much higher. Switch to 64-bit mode and Intel uses a nesting level of 5 lookups each 9-bit. Yes, even if we add the 12-bit for the 4 kilobyte page, that only adds up to 57-bit. We're using a nesting level of 5 and don't even get the whole 64-bit. But it gets even worse. The CPU has explicit virtualization support through a mechanism called second-level address translation. This means that the addresses stored in the page table are what the virtual machine calls physical addresses. They are not actually physical addresses. Instead, they're translated through another page table that maps the virtual machine physical addresses to the actual physical addresses. So each of those five lookups may itself need five lookups to fully resolve, totaling 25 lookups to translate a single memory location. At the risk of stating the obvious, I'll say that this is not optimal. Luckily, the CPU designers also realized that this is not optimal. The solution was a cache for the page table entries. It's called the Translation Lookaside Buffer, or TLB cache. The first time memory needs to be translated, we perform the extra memory accesses. But hopefully, further accesses will already be cached. We do not need to access memory in order to see how the virtual address translates to a physical one. I will point out that caches are what makes modern CPUs go. There are a lot of them. But caches bring up the obvious question of cache coherency. If a page table entry is stored in the cache, and we now want to update that entry, we need to explicitly invalidate the cache. Indeed, TLB invalidation is one of the main performance limiting factors on modern CPUs. Okay, that last statement is a little misleading. TLB invalidation is actually quite quick. What does cost us is the fact that once the TLB is flushed, every new access needs to do three memory access or however many. In other words, it's not the flush that is expensive, it's the repopulation. At least this problem can be greatly mitigated by only flushing the relevant rows. Still, TLB misses are expensive. Which brings us to cache management. When you add a new memory mapping, what actually happens? Say, you open a file and map it to memory. How does the page table change? The perhaps surprising answer is, it does not. Mapping new memory does not, in fact, change the page table. Instead, the kernel just marks to itself that the mapping happened, and that's about it. When you do try to use the memory, the CPU looks up the mapping in the TLB and fails. The mapping doesn't appear there, obviously. So it goes to the page table and checks there. Of course, the page table doesn't have any relevant mapping either. So the CPU raises a page fault exception. This exception is caught by the kernel, which looks up what the region should have had. It notices that the relevant segment is mapped. So it either allocates or finds an existing physical page to go with the mapping, adds the map between the virtual and physical addresses to the page table, and instructs the user space process to retry the operation. So the CPU tries a second time, again resulting in a TLB miss. This time, however, the CPU finds the mapping in the page table, adds it to the TLB, and continues execution. The reason for this somewhat convoluted process is that, at least on Linux, the kernel does something called overcommitting of memory. It will happily allow you to map more memory than you actually have, under the assumption that you won't be using all of it. This allows the kernel to actually allocate only the memory that is actually being used, as well as perform the actual allocation closer to when it's actually needed. Actually. Which finally brings us to the subject of this video. What happens when you want to remove a mapping? I want you to pay very close attention to the following description. There is something missing from it that breaks the consistency of the whole thing. See if you can catch it. Here goes. When you remove a memory mapping, the kernel removes the mapping from the internal kernel tables, removes the mapping from the page table, flushes the relevant lines in the TLB, and frees the physical page. Did you catch it? Did you spot the problem? It's a pretty serious problem. If you didn't spot it, don't feel bad. I didn't spot it for years. To make the problem clearer, let's repeat the description of the mapping process, except this time in multi-threaded environment. This is very handy because 
All of those animations take me hours to prepare, and repeating them saves me a lot of work. In fact, you may have noticed I've been experimenting with animation styles. Feedback welcome in the comments, of course. Which is a good point to mention that if you like my work, please do consider subscribing. If you really, really like my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon. So we have multiple CPU cores, and a thread on one of them performs a mapping. This adds the mapping to the kernel's information and does nothing else. And then one core, not necessarily the same one that performed the mapping, accesses the newly mapped area. That core will have a TLB miss, followed by a page table miss, followed by a page fault, kernel allocating the physical memory and adding it to the page table, retry, TLB miss, and page table hit in the cache. So far, nothing new. The thing to understand is that TLB, like most other caches, are local to the core. Different cores have different caches. So if another core now accesses the same memory, it'll have a TLB miss, but then find the entry at the page table and just cache the mapping and access the memory. Everything's dandy. And now it's time to unmap the memory. We performed the same procedure I described before. The unmapping core removes the mapping from the kernel, removes the entry from the page table, flushes the TLB entries, and frees the physical page. Now it's fairly easy to see the problem. Any other core that ran a thread of the same process may also have the mapping stored in its TLB. If that thread now accesses the memory, it might get a page it no longer is supposed to have access to. Worse, this page may have been recycled and used for something else. This is a fairly serious security problem. The standard way to handle this is an IPI, Interprocessor Interrupt. The core on which the unmap was requested generates an interrupt on all other cores. Those flush the local TLB and acknowledge completion to the original core. The unmap command doesn't finish until all cores have performed the flush and reported completion. This procedure is called TLB shutdown, maybe as an analogy to a sniper shooting down cache entries. Whatever. This procedure solves the security vulnerability. There's just one problem. Do you remember how I said that a TLB flush isn't slow? Yeah, forget about it. This procedure is slow. Interprocessor interrupts are slow, interrupts are disruptive, and the originating core has to wait for completion of all of them. Slow, 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 slow. There are several attempts to make this procedure faster. Some are trivial. If a core never ran the process since the mapping was made, it will not have the mapping inside the TLB and need not be notified. Other suggestions include tracking when the values were actually introduced into the TLB by having separate page tables for each core. These are all obviously high overhead workarounds. You see, the problem with TLB shutdown is that, beside being fairly little known, most people who encounter it are taken by surprise by just how expensive the solution is. By far, my favorite suggestion is a 2020 paper titled Eventually Consistent TLBs, with a caveat that I'm not sure how to pronounce any of the author names. Basically, it reasons that the threads did have legitimate access at some point. The problem is not of revoking that access, but of accessing the page after it's recycled. As such, this suggests delaying both the TLB flush and the recycling. Its only overhead, as far as I can tell, is a potential slight delay in reclaiming no longer needed memory. But one might reasonably wonder why this solution, elegant though it may be, would even be needed. Just stop to think about it for a second. The TLB isn't the only cache in the system. A modern CPU has a whole bunch of caches. There are two caches for the memory, one for reading data and one for executing code. There's a branch prediction cache and also an indirect branch prediction cache. All of those caches represent internal CPU state that needs to reflect data stored outside the CPU, typically in memory, and all of them do not require explicit programmer consideration to maintain coherency. To be fair, branch prediction cache miss, by definition, only costs performance, but my point still stands. Coherency is transparent to the programmer for most caches. Don't get me wrong. You need to know how the caches work in order to maximize performance. 
If you do not take them into consideration, however, no memory read will return the wrong result. When you write a value to memory, the hardware makes sure to invalidate the caches for memory in all other cores of the CPU. Even for different CPUs where the architecture is asymmetric, cache coherency is still a given. Even when PCI devices write to memory, that memory is coherent with the CPU caches. Cache coherency today is almost universally the responsibility of the hardware, not the programmers. So the obvious question is this. Will CPU architectures offload this task as well? In the future, will TLB shutdown be a thing of the past? The answer is a definite maybe. In 2021, Intel issued a white paper called Remote Action Request, or RAR. This does not completely eliminate the TLB shutdown, but it does shift the expensive part of it, that of remote CPUs communicating with the initiator, from software to hardware. In other words, the initiating CPU can request invalidation of certain TLB entries, and the CPU's Hardware performs the invalidation, resulting in less disruption to the remote CPUs and hopefully less overhead. At the moment, only the Sapphire Rapids line will have it, and even they still mark it as experimental. This means that CPUs with the actual technology have only been available since the beginning of 2023. So what does all this mean? Will we now have to count memory and maps? For the time being, at least, I'd say the answer is yes. I think this problem deserves more attention than it's currently getting. I mean, it's not even documented in Wikipedia, not, not as its own entry and not under the translation lookaside buffer one. With that said, I'm hopeful that the solution is around the corner. Who knows, I might even write a Wikipedia article about it myself.